sorry, I'm between you and your drinks. So, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Rahul. Uh, I'm an engineering manager at Cloudera, and I drive the next generation of hybrid platforms, um, compute and data domain. Um, so I can see folks had a busy day. So thanks for taking the energy to show up to this last one. Um, this is our first time ever at the Apache or Community for Code conference, uh, me and my team. Uh, we've always been um, listeners, uh, but this time, you know, thanks for giving us the opportunity to speak about it. So, all right, so who knows what is Apache Iceberg? Okay, so I'm in the minority because I do not, right? So, um, this is cool, this is good. So, apparently, it was bootstrapped in Netflix, and then I confirmed on Google search, it was actually bootstrapped in Netflix, and then contributed to the open source community. It is basically a scalable, high-performant, um, reliable table format for analytical data sets, right? And works with several compute engines, you know, Spark, Presto, Flink, Hive, the usual suspects. So, uh, we decided to have, why not try to protect it? Right. So we need replication, right? We need replication to protect our critical data sets across man-made and, and, you know, natural disasters, right? We basically ensure uh, business continuity by identifying the critical data. Uh, we have policies around it. We evaluate it. We do fire drills. And then we tune it out so that it matches our expectations. So I went to my engineers and asked them, why can't we just copy? Because it's just storage, right? And um, they gave me the dirtiest look. Uh, they said copying storage isn't just sufficient because you have to basically reassemble the data on the pier. But they didn't stop there. They threw terms at me, which often just felt like technical swears. So first they said me schema evaluation. Then they threw hidden partitioning at me. And then time travel. And I was like, I have no freaking idea. So I have to figure it out what it is, all right? So then I decided what is schema evaluation? Right? And I wanted to throw a challenge at it because I'm aware of what Hive does, but I wanted to see how does it compare uh, on the iceberg side. Right? So one of the pain points with the uh, Hive table is, uh, suppose I want to do an alter table, right? So if you can see the column, it's a very uh, you know, non-significant looking column. I'm just adding a zip code, but it has a tremendous effect on the Bay Area properties because you know it's one of the most expensive place to stay, right? But um, as a result of this, the entire uh, table data set has to be rewritten. Now, in case of Hive, um, you know, as you know, the, the database is basically stored as a set of directories and subdirectories. So, you know, relaying that format is, is going to be a troublesome operation. It's going to be resource intensive and even worse when these operations need to be executed at scale, right? Also, they're slow and inefficient. So, um, what one of the most, uh, considering all of these issues, one of the most architectural changes in Iceberg uh, that the inventors did was to track table data uh, by directly managing the data files and keep an inventory of the data file in basically a persistent tree structure, right? So atomic update essentially means it's just a new metadata file and then you can update the catalog to point to the new metadata file. So this resulted uh, in tremendous performance benefits, you could have lockless leaders because they'll have consistent uh, view of the particular table at any given time. Also, writers can actually work in isolation because they can try to get to the data that they want, make the change, and then essentially um, any change is just an update in the catalog to point to the new metadata file, right? So thus, MetaStore or catalog is no longer a bottleneck. The next one I wanted to tackle was uh, hidden partition. Right? So, partitioning, as we know, it uh, refers to dividing the data into an application's database into separate pieces for um, faster access and overall performance benefits. We lay it around our horizontal scale. So, but they get complex uh, pretty soon, right? You have to maintain them. Uh, first of all, if you have to change them, then it essentially is going to consume a lot of resources. You have to reformat the data as well, relay out the data, right? They're also very user prone. Because, for example, on the right, I have an ETL query where I'm ingesting into the sale transactions table. So I have to call out what the partition is going to be, right? With that, if I actually forget adding the partition in my query, it's going to scan the entire table. So the result is going to take a ton of time, and it may be not even the result that we actually hoped for. So Iceberg makes all of this simple with hidden partitioning. 
right? So it does all of this under the hood and doesn't force the user to actually supply a partition filter at the query time. So um, it also provides several partitioning options. So it has a certain transform. It can identify a table that you have been partitioned on a specific data and time, and it can actually have transforms that can go down to a granular scale of ours, right? It's also agnostic to the physical layout of the table. So basically, uh, partition implementation and evolution is essentially, again, a now a metadata operation and does not eagerly rewrite data files, right? So um, if I have to evolve my table to have another partition, I can do that at the courtesy of split planning, where Iceberg actually divides the query into two parts, one where the partition was a different one and then partition was a different one. This actually works in schema evolution as well. So when actually Iceberg starts executing the query, the query plan actually contains of data that was partitioned by month, data that was partitioned by R, it can combine the results and it can, you know, it give a consistent result across pre-change and post-change. Okay, so next we have our favorite professor, Dr. Emmett Brown, talking to us about time travel, right? Humans, for, for the longest time, wanted to always go back in time to fix that one mistake. Right, so one of the most crucial um, features that Iceberg provides is inbuilt snapshots and changes, right? So let me talk a bit about the structure for Iceberg. I think you might have seen that particular Iceberg spec image all around the web, but I thought, why not, let's create one more. Uh, but I would like to build it bottom up, right? So the first and the closest to the ground, you have data files. They basically map data directly on disk, and this will be Parquet, Orc, or Avro, whichever format you choose. Then we have manifest files, which are basically pointers to those data files. To keep an account of the manifest files, you have manifest list files. So information about all the list files, but it also groups together manifest files so that it can bucket into one particular snapshot. On top of this, to account for that, you have metadata file or snapshot files, which basically keep the schema partition, the snapshot detail, and then it points an anchor to the list of manifest files that are part of this particular snapshot. And again, like I mentioned, now if I have a new snapshot, the table to act, the, the operation to actually update the state of the table is just going to be an update in my catalog to find to the new snapshot file. Okay, and the applications for this, right, uh, they're tremendous. If you attended the previous session, um, we had a ton of real life use cases where time travel was very critical. So you can run queries for regulatory workflows and auditing changes to a table. Uh, you can also specify which snapshot you want to read from or which particular time you want to restore it. You can also have point in time uh, rollback queries where you're, if you're done experimenting, um, basically, if you have a table, you want to cure it, tune it, you can actually go back, start with, a, start with the base point and then go again. And you can also use projections, uh, joins and filters on this particular query results that you get. So if you actually query a table, for all the available snapshots, uh, you'll get a ton of them. And then you can actually um, select at which particular ID you want to go to or which particular timestamp you want to go to. So with this, I can actually go back in time, right? And with that, we've achieved time travel. So I'm gonna hand it over to Shailesh to, to talk a bit about the control plane and then followed by Teddy will talk a bit about the data plane. Hey, thanks Rahul for actually taking time to figure out what really iceberg internals are and why replication isn't as straightforward as just moving the data. Uh, hi everyone, I am Shailesh. I am an architect at Cloudera, primarily looks at data protection and replication. As with every replication system, we have fundamental key components of a replication system, which is management plane, control plane, and data plane. What we have is management plane decides how replication policies should be managed, they should be monitored. What are the useful metrics which a subsystem should provide to admins? Control plane finally is responsible to orchestrate a flow of control between source and destination and how the execution should really occur for optimal usage and where the data replication can actually take place. Data plane finally decides how the actual data movement happens between source and destination and how it scales as your data set itself scales. Uh, I'll cover the, cover the basics of management plane and the control plane. And let's see what it really takes to execute a replication policy. Uh, in order to understand 
uh, replication policy itself. Let's see what makes a useful replication policy for an admin. And if we take a look at it, a policy needs to have a meaningful, uniquely identified name. Next would be, it has a source cluster, which is your, where your source iceberg tables reside. Finally, what is my destination? Is it my on-prem cluster? Is it my cloud? Is it my uh, entire compute environment, which is residing in a completely different destination? What's the frequency? This is essentially a asynchronous replication because uh, many systems decides like a synchronous replication. This is an attempt from Cloudera to actually provide a asynchronous replication, which requires a interval. And this is where you specify something like a Unix run format. Finally, for the context of replication, it is very important as your data set continues to grow, applications would have need to contain specific subsets. And inclusion filters always helps with that because as your, your various ETL pipelines workflows, they decide what are the subsets which should be included. And similarly, you will have tables which are transient in nature, which are temporary. You do not want them to be in the scope of replication because that's a data which is not at all going to be useful for applications. This is a filtering where the exclusion filter helps in simply identifying that those tables are not part of replication itself. Now that we understand the replication policy itself, let's actually take a broad overview of what a replication subsystem looks like from the control plane point of view. A quite close analogy of an overall replication workflow is something a ELT workflow. Here we look at primary three key steps. The export step is something which is always synonymous to extract phase in an ELT lifecycle. This identifies what are the data files, what are the metadata files, which should be part of the scope of replication. The transfer makes sure that these are transferred from source to destination, and this is synonymous to your load phase, where it ensures that you do not lose out on any of the important data as well as metadata footprint. Finally, the transform phase is something which is synonymous to the sync step. And this is where, as Rahul explained earlier, the iceberg schema is formed of data files, manifest list, manifest files, and the metadata files. Once someone takes a look behind the scenes, we know that these are very specific to individual environment. A transformation is an important step here, which ensures that these metadata files are now reflecting to the correct data sets on destination. With an overview, let's take a look behind the scenes as what it takes for a control plane to orchestrate a replication workflow. Here you have a source and destination and you have a component called as control plane manager, which is actually responsible for coordinating flow of commands between source and destination. Admin has created a replication policy, which we Notice earlier, the control plane manager fetches the policy from the RDBMS. It evaluates the table filters. It finds out what exactly is in the scope of replication and what should be the tables from source which needs to be replicated. Uh, it talks to the meta store. So this is an important point to find out what is the current latest status of these tables. In replication, two key terms are always thrown around. One is bootstrap replication and second is incremental replication. This particular step identifies that for the very first phase of replication, the destination does not contain any iceberg tables. This is where the current state from the meta store will identify what is the place where the replication needs to continue from. For the very first replication, the replication system just informs that get all the data, but on subsequent reruns, the checkpoint would be a valid file which will actually inform at what snapshot currently my source iceberg tables are. Once this information is curated from the export, it passes this information to the source system. Source subsystem at this point launches a process called as export. This is the extract phase of your ETL workload. This identifies the scope of the tables which are part of my replication. It uh, calls the Metastore APIs to iterate the entire schema. At this point of time, the Metastore will give you metadata file, manifest, files manifest list, and the data files which now make the entire scope of replication. This is a enumerated list, and as we have seen with the various inefficiencies, these enumerated lists are quite important to nicely curate because you can have cases where you're just going to iterate over thousands of files and millions of files, maybe in potentially really large cases. 
you do want to make sure that this enumeration is done correctly so that you can always replicate bootstrap followed by increment. Once the result is properly generated, this export.json is now provided back to the destination cluster. So at this phase, it completes the extract phase of a ETL job. Uh, here the extracted data is basically given back to the destination and destination has to make careful choices as how it does a data transfer. Uh, destination launches basically a transfer job at this point with the given input which is already done by the source. The key distinction is the transfer process is smart enough and it launches multiple DCP jobs or distributed copy jobs behind the scenes. Here, uh, typical Hadoop clusters always have YAN as the resource managers and then it decides that at this point it needs to now read the data files and metadata files from the source and correctly write them to the destination cluster. Once the schema evolved, basically everyone talked about the schema evolution, hidden partitioning and the metadata layout. The key important point here is the data files from source can come exactly at the final location on the data files or destination, but the metadata is where which really needs to be transformed and curated and at this point, till this point, the iceberg tables are not yet available on destination. So the metadata files in the transfer step are just kept at the staging path. Uh, finally, at this point, we have done the extract and load phase of a ELT job and what is remaining is essentially the transformation. So this is where the control plane manager launches the sync CLI or the transform process. It sees the input as these metadata files which are present on the staging path. Uh, Iceberg currently in its existing spec has its manifest list, manifest files and metadata files to have a fully qualified domain name. If you are on on-prem on HDFS, it has Hadoop as HDFS as a scheme. If you are using Iceberg on S3, it has S3 as a scheme. But these are fully qualified domain names. Part of replication process is to ensure that these fully qualified domain names are mapped correctly on destination where they are updated. And now they are actually building up the tree backwards up where this is where from the data files, manifest file, manifest list, and metadata is synchronously updated. And at this point, the catalog is updated saying admins can use the iceberg tables and they can actually read on the same way. So these three steps, which is extract, load, and transform, completes overall the basics of a control plane replication workflow. This sets the ground as why you need like a control plane manager to coordinate these processes, have the correctness, and launch the various jobs, and coordinate with respect to entities on either the source or the destination. Uh, take a look at some of the quick peaks from the management point of view. What a good mon basically management system needs to provide. A good management system needs to provide monitoring. It's pretty critical for admins to really know hey, how their applications are really working. What is my current execution status? Is it currently doing export? Is it transfer? Is it sync? Or is it already done? What was the overall policy result? Did it succeed correctly? Did it fail? What was the runtime of each step? Hey, do you have some runtimes which are in sync with what you were expecting or are they out of tune? This is where a uh, management plane provides a centralized plane of view where admins can see all the historical data of how their policies are executed. And this also helps them in spotting the outliers. And they can really see what exactly happened. Was it the burst workload which happened? Was it a inefficiency where your resource manager was not functioning correctly? The management plane has to provide historical data along with the executions and that's how admins can ensure that its SLAs are actually met as the replication is running. Uh, finally, the another crucial part of management plane is what are the metrics which it provides to admin? Okay. Is it fine? Yeah. The important part of a okay, I think I'm not sure. Uh, what are the useful metrics which admin can use when they see replication has actually succeeded correctly? Uh, did it provide the number of tables which are part of the policy? How many data files were replicated? It should contain the list of delete files explicitly because your CRUD operations are going to be performed. It contains essentially manifest files which are transformed where explicit path information was updated in each of these manifest files to ensure that the metadata is now correctly represented on destination. And no management system can 
be useful without providing appropriate troubleshooting and diagnostics. This is where management system needs to have ability to collect the diagnostics from source. If something went wrong with the export, what really happened? Did it not contact the Metastore correctly? Was the iteration of schema run into some error? Similarly, on destination, did resource manager run into any issues? Did the update of Metastore run into any glitches? Uh, diagnostics and troubleshooting basically from source and destination helps admins to figure out how the replications are running and how they can actually seamlessly go. So with this, we now have an overview of basically what it takes from the management plane and the control plane. I'll hand it over to Teddy who gives us a detail behind the scenes into actual execution of these tools and into the database. Over to you, Teddy. Hello, I'm Teddy Choi, uh, and Apache Hive committer, and I'm Apache Iceberg Data Plane Architect. Uh, 20 years ago, I attended uh, for ApacheCon as a young engineer. It's the place where I started my Apache journey, and it's great to come back as a speaker. So, let's start with the Apache uh, iceberg replication process. If you have ever been in IKEA, it may sound familiar. So you check out, deliver, and assemble tables. So how the looks, warehouse, tables, those core concepts are mostly same, just few differences. Iceberg calls assembly manuals as metadata layer, parts as data layer, and screws as references. Let's start with two examples, bootstrap replication and incremental replication. So let's bring some chair first. It's a bootstrap replication. The chair product manual has a reference to a chair module manual, which has part numbers. And we don't want to assemble in the store, so let's check out the list, then deliver them to our home. Because it's flat packed, we cannot use it yet. So we need to assemble it to use. All chair processes correspond on this diagram. Export, transfer, then sync. Let's visit the store again. Uh, we find that the armchair, uh, the chair can be upgraded to an armchair with a couple of amps. So let's check out the amps module first, then deliver it to home. Then uh, we can assemble the arm module to, on the chair module for a new armchair thanks to its modular structure. We don't need to buy two chairs. That's efficient. So all chair processes also correspond on this diagram. Export, transfer, then sync again. So I decided to read the metadata files and compare them then. Rahul asked me, why don't you simply uh, just list files recursively? It's simple and fast. But I told him that it's slow and expensive on Amazon S3. Also, he asked me again, uh, why don't you read all metadata files? It would be very simple. That it may choke the HDFS name node E very easily for millions of files. And I started with depth first search implementation for tree traversal. But I found it runs forever. It took several days for just a small number of snapshots. So you can see some file is read 11 times in this small example. Something, something's wrong. What did I wrong? So I realized there can be multiple hidden bottlenecks 
and I'm good at it. Like, <laughs> yeah, because like I was uh, a committer of Apache Hive, the Stinger initiative, the vectorization, the optimization uh, part was my uh, role, and I can do that. The first bottleneck uh, was the repeated reads. The depth first search is an efficient implementation for true traversal. However, iceberg has not this tree structure. It has a graph structure which allows overlapping subgraphs. So in graphs, DFS causes repeated reads on cubic time. So breast first search enables deduplication. Each deduplication only takes a constant time, but it takes a few gigabytes of memory, which we can pay easily. And breast first search with deduplication optimizes from the cubic time to quadratic time, which is a huge boost. In this example, you can see all files are read exactly once, but it still took hours. The second bottleneck was unnecessary read. In most cases, the change is less than just 1% of total data. Uh, the common data between the source and the destination is more than 99%. They should be skipped. It would be very simple in a tree structure. However, it's hard to say whether a net change is referenced by others or not in a graph. And we found that Apache Iceberg has the optimistic concurrency model, which guarantees a snapshot is always based on its parents only. So we need it, just need to read the start and the end of common snapshots. It's enough to find what files are referenced by common subgraphs. The skipping uh, breath first search reduced time hours to minutes because it now reads the changed files only. You can see that uh, the common files are skipped. The third bottleneck is too many small files syndrome. Small files still takes a couple of seconds in HDFS for like network connection establishment. As all tables are independent from each other, it is easy to make it multi-threaded per table. The multi-threaded skipping uh, breadth first search reduced time from minute to second. Uh, I could, could uh, actually create uh, 50 threads in a server, so now it's very fast. But Wowl asked me again, so using it still slower than HDFS and Ozone file listing because it still needs many files, which is true. But iceberg metadata files are small and immutable, so we can cache them to reduce file reads very easily. So we can ship them to make it faster, even faster than the file listing from those file systems. In summary, uh, we optimized from days to seconds. It's multi-threaded, press first search, deduplicated, skipping, and cache it. And now it's very fast. And the iceberg replication is linearly scalable. The replication time grows as each data size increases. 
then you can add more machines to reduce the total time. The file transfer is the longest job, so it's distributed among multiple machines. Other operations are multi-threaded to reduce IOS wait time. Iceberg re replication is ready for enterprise users. It supports all data formats, including Apache Parquet, ORC, and Avro. It supports all table specification versions from V2, 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 V2 uh, from 1 to 2. <laughs> It supports all Hadoop configurations, including high availability and security features. Okay. We have an exciting roadmap. First, we will support more storage vendors. On top of current Apache Hadoop HDFS, we will support uh, Apache Ozon and Amazon S3. Second, we will support more compute vendors. We now support private to private replication only, but Apache Nox already supports Amazon, Azure, and Google Cloud integration. So we'll port uh, iceberg replication to public cloud. It will enable all hybrid multi-cloud replication scenarios, including public to public public to private, private to public. Next, we will bring more optimizations. Uh, no, uh, we will support more use cases, failover and migrated external tables on the top of the list. Static file support is also coming. Last, we will bring more optimizations for petabyte scale, micro batch, Replication is coming, which splits a large replication into smaller ones. After a long downtime, a replication may be very long. Uh, the worst case in that we want to avoid is that snapshot expiration during replication, which will be fatal and hard to recover. So, this micro batch will help to reduce the time window. And distributed export and synchronization is also coming. It will ensure more processes are linearly scalable for fewer bottlenecks. And there's a team behind the, this product, and we have excellent measures and great engineers. Without them, it couldn't be possible to bring iceberg replication today. So we are evaluating the process of open source software contribution also. So, and thank you for listening. Do you have any questions?